Since then, uh, <laughs> welcome to the Liberal Lodge. I'm Aiden Mattis. I'm the host of the show. This is my producer, Aiden Thornbury. Um, Santa Claus thing. Okay, Milo, reintroduce yourself to the people. <laughs> That I can do. <clears throat> Howdy, everyone. Uh, my name is Milo. Uh, I use the alias Mini Minuteman. Um, I'm probably the most known from TikTok, where I do uh, videos talking about uh, conspiracy theories uh, and archaeology and anthropology. I am a senior uh, studying environmental science and archaeology, and ideally would like to try and go into archaeology as a field later in life, but uh, it's not exactly an easy field, so who really knows about that? This is this is the best I got right now. Um, but yeah, I'm, I've been looking forward to this for quite a while. Um, I know Aiden and I've had some some back and forth, and we definitely have some pretty interesting, uh, you know, uh, I guess dual content. And so I've been really looking forward to chatting with him for a little bit, and I'm just really happy to be here. So, Aidens, uh, both of you, thanks for having me on board, and I'm looking forward to hearing what y'all have to say. Thank you very much for hopping on. Um, yeah, thanks for dealing so, with the. Uh, yeah. I, I do want to quickly ask because I've been curious about it. Uh, where where did the mini minute man alias come from? <laughs> <laughs> so, so the Mini Minuteman alias was actually uh, my. It originated as my Minecraft username when I was twelve. Um, so, <laughs> yes. So, so much. Yeah, so there, there's a little piece of, of lore for for the lodge. Um, I, my uh, my best friend actually helped me come up with it, and we uh, when so I grew up just outside of Lexington, Massachusetts. So we were very you know steeped in the American Revolution culture, and I was really into it. And so I was like, how can I make a username that it like kind of involves that? And so my buddy was just off the tip of his tongue as a twelve year old mini minute man, and I'm like, boom, golden, and here we are. It <laughs> so, works. <laughs> Yes. It's pretty good, yeah. It really does roll off the tongue well, it so does. it works out well. Yeah. I, I love that the backup account is Medium Minute Man. That's very funny. <laughs> yeah, I know. Someone yeah, said well, that my... if I make a third, it has to be Mega, mega Minute yeah. Man. Oh, yeah, I was going to say well, Massive. So, so yeah, my, my, personal massive. Backup, my personal backup, the one that's not the Lore Lodge, yeah. is and Aiden Mattis. Really? So I took it and I made it an indefinite article instead of a definite article. <laughs> <laughs> the, amount, the amount of people in this world that would appreciate the difference between a definite and indefinite it's article. Very is niche. Very, small, very niche. Very it's like small. the I don't know if you saw this, but I uh, I made a TikTok a few days ago using the our table it's broken sound, but it was about the Bronze Age collapse, and um, almost almost nobody <laughs> got it. It was, it was very niche. <laughs> It was whoosh. It was good topic. That would be was, that would be a fun one to cover at some point. I, I got to talk about it today. I, somebody was like, "Can you tell us about the Sea Peoples?" And I was like, "I can try. Um, <laughs> I can do what I can." What we know. There's not a lot. I was like basically just summarizing a, a YouTube lecture that I had watched with uh, Dr. Eric Klein, <laughs> and um, a fantastic lecture. It's called 1177 BC, uh, like the year the world collapsed or something like that. It's Eric Klein, if you look it up. Mm -hmm. uh, highly recommend. Very interesting lecture. And he's very funny. He's a good speaker. Um, I forget what university he teaches at, but he's a PhD. Uh, but so today we have three main topics. And the way this show is structured, the way it goes, for those of you who are new here, is we do about an hour of discussion beforehand and then 30 minutes to 45 minutes of questions. Um, the way we do those questions is that we will answer any super chats first, and then if we have time, we will get back to uh, non-super chat questions. So that is basically how we fund the show. Um, so That's how we fund large portions yeah. of our lives. So we really and we justify do doing it. this. Yes. yes. <laughs> so feel free to contribute. If you don't, we absolutely understand. There's no pressure to do so. Um, but to, to get into it, we're going to have three topics today. Those are going to be prehistoric megalithic architecture, um, the Clovis culture in North America, and the uh, debate over Atlantis and the plausibility of a prehistoric, uh, rather advanced civilization. Not to the ancient aliens level of, you know, uh, whatever the hell is Damn. going on in the Assassin's Creed backstory. Uh, we're not talking about that. We're talking about, you know, something more along the lines of, like, Tenochtitlan in uh, Central America. But that's that's where I get out on it. I, I know if you talk to... It, you bring up Atlantis to anybody who's not a mainstream archaeologist, and they're going to have some wacky opinions about it. I like to oh, think. Yeah. I like to think that being a medievalist, I have more down to earth opinions, but <laughs> we'll find out. Yeah, I feel like one of the one of the best parts about it is if you do bring it up to anybody who is kind of involved in that conspiracy, is every single one of them will tell you that it's in a different part of the world. They'll be like, "Oh yeah, they found it in like the deserts of like oh, yeah, Africa. It's the eye like, of the Sahara. It's in the Bahamas." <laughs> Yeah, it's just everywhere. Yeah. Meanwhile, Plato is very explicit about where it is. He's like, it's right out past the pillars of Heracles, and that's just 
right outside the Straits of Gibraltar. Right. So, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, I, that's the one for me. I'm like, if we're going with Plato's description, um, he's not exactly mincing words. Also, but of course, there's this whole thing about Athens, and uh, we'll get into it. Um, <laughs> we'll, yeah, we'll get to that. <laughs> we'll, we'll start with the the megalithic architecture. So, examples of this uh, prehistoric megalithic architecture is um, some of the better known ones are like uh, Stonehenge and the Sphinx. Uh, the Sphinx being kind of on the border of what we'd consider prehistoric, uh, as well as just some of these these large stone circles and whatnot all throughout Europe, uh, parts of Africa. And um, it, in my opinion, I think some of the ancient terraces in China are very interesting. Cons- like how far back they were doing that is fascinating to me. But I, I think the, the one that probably draws the most contention is uh, Gobekli Tepe. This is, this is the yes. one that is the focus of many Ancient Aliens episodes and a lot of what Graham Hancock talks about. Uh, it was first... Oh, yeah. I, I first ran into it in an Intro to Anthropology course when I was a freshman in college. That was... It was, uh, you know, Human Evolution or something like that. I can't remember the... It was like Anth 001. Um, and <laughs> it's the exactly, very first one, yeah. <laughs> exactly. So, uh, and it was... The way it was described to us was, here's this weird, mysterious, megalithic architecture in southern Turkey. We don't know why it was built but it's here. Um, that was in 2016. There's been further excavation since, some of it very interesting, some of it very mundane, but I, one thing that I remembered as I was doing some research for this show was you had some opinions about the Sphinx um, and about the Sphinx I do. conspiracy. I have some so opinions about the Sphinx. I would love for you to, for you to tell us a little bit about what, what grinds your gears regarding Sphinx conspiracy theorists. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Um, so... I guess for, for those of you that don't know, there's a conspiracy uh, that involves the idea that beneath the Sphinx is buried a chamber where the supposed aliens that built the pyramids left the, uh, I guess, like the secrets of humanity. You know, a, a chamber, an Indiana Jones style thing where you go in and I don't know, what was the thing in the end of uh, Temple, not Temple of Doom, in uh, Crystal Skull where the woman just like oh, melts God, from getting all the knowledge of the universe. Yeah, exactly. It's like just, that. Just kind to of really deal. quickly so, sidetrack, that movie had so much potential and it just... Oh, threw it away. <laughs> I could, I could write a fucking thesis on it. That the scene with the nuke. I don't even. Yeah. Well, wait, 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 <laughs> anyway, wait, just, just a minor sidetrack as well. What do you think of the conversation or like the debate in terms of this question for both of you, in terms of the fact that the movie did so poorly because the only two really successful ones of that franchise were Christian focused, whereas the ones that deviated from that seemed to do poorly. Uh, I didn't even. I hadn't even thought of that. I have never thought of that. That's interesting. Damn. Yeah, I'll have to, I, I, I'd be curious to look more into that. Yeah, I, mean, anyway, I guess so it the, would uh, make sense because it's relatable to a broader audience. Yeah, especially in America. Yeah. Anyway, back to the... Yeah, and it's like the... common folklore. Yeah. 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 So the Sphinx. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so anyway, at the bottom of the Sphinx is the chamber where the, 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 the Russian lady wants to know and she gets her head mm-hmm. melted off. Um, so obviously the, the first thought is, well, it would be pretty easy to prove that because we know where the Sphinx is and apparently it's underneath the Sphinx. Um, <clears throat> so the thing which really grinds me about it is not only, you know, the conspiracy is one thing, you know, and I can, uh, you know, argue that uh, day in and day out. But the, 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 the really troubling part is the fact that they actually did some excavations to try and, um, you know, find this uh, supposed chamber. And so in doing this, they sunk like a, I think it was like an eight, eight inch diameter drill bit through the paw of the Sphinx into the ground to look for it. And in doing that, they caused irreversible structural damage to the <coughs> megalith itself. Um, and because of that, they've had to completely halt like any excavation around it because they had to like enact their own set of like rules and laws because of this really abrasive, invasive, um, damaging form of archaeology. Mm-hmm. So obviously, you know, it's one thing that pseudoscience can be a bit of a you know, almost it, it can be a poison to the the integrity of the idea of archaeology. But when it becomes enough that it begins to actually damage archaeological sites, it kind of it, it verges into a bit of a sacred space there. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'd say that of all the things, it is the fact that there was irreversible damage done because of this conspiracy that really irks me about it. Yeah, it's it, yeah. I, I didn't know about the Paul one. The one that I've seen yeah. the most about is the uh, the the erosion around the the base of the Sphinx and how. Uh, oh, yeah. And I was literally just watching a Graham Hancock video on it because I'm sitting there. I'm like, <laughs> I need to make sure. I need to make sure that I like got my dates for everything right. Um, <laughs> I'm, like, I'm cross, glad I'm terrible. I'm, like, cross dates, re- I'm so. cross referencing and everything. Dates are the only numbers I can understand. Um, <laughs> no if, you, math. if you ask me to do math, it will not happen. 
But sometimes there's math involved with dates. But I can, well, I can pull dates out of my head like that. It's weird. Um, that's wild. Yeah. I, I guess it's good. Um, maybe because it's just pure memorization. I think that's what it is. It's memorization. Yeah. It's not, yeah. But anyway, point being, um, so the, the erosion aspect, which I, not being an archaeologist, I actually thought at first when I saw that, I was like, wait, that's interesting. That's an interesting point. Um, I'm sorry. I'm not laughing at you. I'm laughing at Super De- Chats. Destro threw in the Super Chats, the first Super Chat of the night. For two dollars, he says, "Oh no, our Sphinx, <laughs> it's broken." And yeah, so that's. Oh, no. I just comedy gold, everybody. Yeah, I, I Look, just you take over the it. podcast. I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> He's too good. He's uh, too good. I love that. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so that was that was one that I saw that I was as not being an archaeologist, I was like, wait a second, yeah, that's kind of a good point. So please tell me, tell me why it's not a good point. Um, so I, I presume you're you're talking about the the theory that the Sphinx is far older than people say it is because they say it has water erosion. Yes, on it. and water correct? has obviously not rained or been in Egypt in that. You you haven't had that much water in that portion of Egypt in the last five thousand years. Therefore, the Sphinx must yeah. be older. That's the argument. Okay. Yeah. So uh, that's a, a very I've, I've heard that one a good bit before. And honestly, like from just a surface level of erosion, it makes a ton of sense. And that's, I guess, kind of the thing about it is mm-hmm. if you just like look at erosion and you're familiar with just what general erosion looks like, and you know, water is kind of the one that causes it the most, you could look at that and be like, yeah, this is water erosion. Um, the, the biggest giveaway for me that it's not water erosion is the fact that the lines are uh, not horizontal. They are kind of like curved slightly mm-hmm. or not curved but um sloped mm-hmm. uh, which indicate a, a little bit more in, in indicative of the sphinx being buried in sand uh and it's windblown sand erosion mm-hmm. so as a slope occurs uh from just uh sand buildup and then wind kind of pulls this particulate matter across it really fast it sand blasts little channels into the side mm-hmm. um whereas if it were water erosion at least to the best of my understanding the erosion would be far more linear mm-hmm. uh than slanted because water doesn't tend to really like going no, like this it's no, sort it's of a, a this kind of deal yeah um there's also uh one of the other pieces that people have used to kind of bolster that is the area around the sphinx so the sphinx uh was built i believe around the same time that the the great pyramid was built and the stone that was used for the great pyramid was quarried pretty much like around the sphinx so we know that they were built roughly around the same time due to inscriptions on the temple behind the Sphinx. Mm-hmm. Um, but the stone work around it, um, where you can see like, you know, where the stone blocks were quarried, have kind of these little lines that look very similar to water erosion. And those ones, I do believe, are. Because even though this is a desert, this area does receive about an inch of water every year, or an inch of rainfall every year. Which is not very much, but when you realize that this land has been exposed for, you know, what, 4,000 years, it'll, it'll add up over time. Um, so it, it it can be a little bit difficult to differentiate between the the um, the water erosion and the sand erosion, but that that's definitely something that I think gets very muddled in this conspiracy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, just off the very basic, I, my my area of what I would call expertise, I guess, uh, extends basically from um, you know the founding of Rome and the Greco uh, colonial period up through um, the the later Middle Ages. I I. I tend to say that I get lost after um, the Laws and Wales Acts of 1536 and 1537. Wow, you're, you're going to be perfect for the ancient Rome video. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the thing is I'm like, ooh. As, as anyone who's been paying attention on TikTok is probably aware, I have been going in lately. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you really have. But that's I actually... I was going for it. That's, uh, d- I mean, I, I'm having a great time. Um, and I don't, I don't have schoolwork to do, so I'm just like... <laughs> Sitting at my desk all day, like, all oh, right, let's, let's, uh, <laughs> let's ruin someone's reputation. Um, but I think I I want to tie that into what's been going on with uh, with Mom Millennial, with our with our good friend Donna Donna Dickens, oh, yeah, who Donna. is not on the graduation rolls for Western Kentucky University and does not have a BA in anthropology or archaeology or history, as I confirmed with a staff member. At WKU, she in fact. You're gonna have to tell. You're gonna have to elaborate on this because a lot of people have been telling me that you did that research, and I, I have did. to. I have to know it. So you, I'll let you finish your thought, but you yeah. got to get into that at some point. Yeah. So I uh, no, I but I did have it confirmed, and it was uh, also confirmed to me um, in rather vague, uh, not breaking any privacy laws terms that she did not leave for financial reasons. Uh, she left for not passing her classes reasons 
So not not only is this person lying about her bachelor's degree, but she uh, is also lying about why she doesn't have the bachelor's degree she lied and said she has. Um, which is weird, because, like, why would you say you have a B.A. in history? What, for As someone with a B.A. in medieval history, why would you lie about that? That's not impressive. Yeah, like, pick something I, cooler. Come on. I mean... <laughs> you have a master's in astrophysics. Fucking go for it. Send got, it all the way to the bank. I got, I got done graded. I got theory. graded. I got an A in a course because I watched the movie Kingdom of Heaven. Are you serious? <laughs> All I had to do was prove I watched it, and I got, like, a, a 100% on a, a paper. I, I'm i not kidding. Um, oh, so, and yeah. she had to fake that? My exactly. God. I'm like, come on. And the thing is, like, it of all the majors to fake having, history is probably the easiest one. Because all you have to do is go, like, on JSTOR and look up whatever mainstream historians are saying and just parrot it. Yeah. Instead, she, like, <laughs> decided to not read anything. And she went rogue. Yeah, it's, it, and, I mean, on top of that, like, look, I, I'm all for some fun and games and some conspiracy theories and some general stuff, you know, like, mm -hmm. like it, you know, there's some fun things to bandy around, like, was Thomas Jefferson a member of the Illuminati? Uh, are the national parks Ooh, actually no. hiding the Wendigos? Yes. Um, <laughs> obviously. Obviously. There's... I mean, I, but, but all of these things do have, like, little inklings of truth in them. Like, Teddy Roosevelt did did tell a story about, uh, you know, a, a Sasquatch encounter. Not that he had, but that somebody told him about. And he seemed rather, like, amb ambivalent towards it, bordering on supportive. Um, and, you know, mm. that's something that you can look up. It's there. So, you know, there's, there's some... some yeah evidence to that and of course with with the conspiracy with the national parks one you know you've got the missing form one phenomenon you've got all of this native american folklore about what's lurking out in the woods um you know i, I look at it and i'm like there's enough to ask some questions um if mm -hmm. you know i'm not going to tell people don't go hiking in the national parks because you're going to get eaten by a wendigo i've never said that to anybody ever <laughs> um i routinely go hiking in a national park that's 10 minutes from my apartment yes. You just say, don't go whistling in the woods at night. Exactly. I'm like, if you hear somebody, if you hear what sounds like a baby crying or a woman calling from help when you're alone in the woods, call the park rangers. Yeah. Don't go looking yourself. Um, also, in, yeah. uh, in terms of fun and games, by the way, yeah. I just want to let you know, you've been bestowed a new name. Oh, good. Indiana Mattis. <laughs> what? <laughs> Okay, I'll Just take it. Out. I'll take it. it. Rolls rolls off the tongue. I don't mind right. it. I don't mind it. Um, you know, as long as it's not Illinois. Uh, or Ohio. We named the God, dog. Never yeah. Ohio. Never Ohio. <laughs> Ohio can do. Mm -mm. Ugh, don't even say that word to me. But yeah, so but yeah, stuff like that. You know, there's letters from George Washington to uh, other other founding fathers, as well as some of his um, Masonic counterparts saying that he's concerned that Thomas Jefferson's ties to the Illuminati are going to affect the Freemason lodges in America. Like little conspiracies like that here and there, you know, interesting and fun to explore. Uh, who boy is saying that the church made up the Roman empire, a hell of a conspiracy theory. Yeah. For, yeah. for those watching who are not familiar and for me, who has not seen all of the videos, do you want to do, and I don't know how much uh, you know, Milo, about this as well, but, like, should we do a little recap of <laughs> who exactly this is, what's going on, why it's important, and what we're going to do about it? Sure. Yeah, uh, I mean, Milo, you're uh, you're the Captain America of this Avengers team, so... <laughs> um, I, I appreciate that. I'll I, take that I'm title. thinking of myself more <laughs> as, like, Hawkeye. I was going to say, what is, I guess that <laughs> makes good. That's a good one to be. I, yeah. I want to be Hawkeye. Where's my bow? Uh, so <laughs> it's in here somewhere. <laughs> I guess that, that makes me be your Tony Stark all the tech and stuff. I can start being a sarcastic yeah, you, asshole too. Yeah, you 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 already have like an AirPod in a glowing laptop, yeah. and you're drinking out of a mug. You're pretty much halfway there. Well, to yeah. be fair, this is my glowing laptop. Um, <laughs> oh, I do a mind laptop. Just had to had to flex that there. a little bit. It's I, I just don't you know I, I'm a gamer derogatory. Um, <laughs> Oh, yeah. you mean the, you mean the most oppressed? The most the oppressed, uh, <laughs> most oppressed group. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, Celtic gamers really just 
you know, the most oppressed group in history. Uh, but yeah, uh, Milo Hotel. you wearing that, that necklace. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, Everyone will know you're a Celtic gamer. Yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> but tell, yeah, Celtic yeah, gamer um, in the gaming chair. Like, oh, yeah, yeah, tell us, uh, yeah. tell us what the plan is. <laughs> well, wait, okay. Well, so, real quick, before we get to the plan, I was gonna say before yeah. we get to the plan, we should probably say who it is. Yeah, that's. I'm, I'm, oh, oh, the plan has to do with everything. everything. Okay, go on. Yeah, no, I, it's... I'll, I'll give the I'll give the lowdown. Okay, cool. Yeah, give us so, give us the story. For those of you who don't know or already know and just feel like uh, hearing more of the exact same thing I've already said, um, <laughs> there is a woman on, uh, on on TikTok who is a proponent of a conspiracy that, as far as I can tell, she made up um, and has not originated anywhere other there, than her. There is, uh, which an, is the, or, there is an original version of this. I don't think it's quite as really? insane as hers. It's from uh, Anthony. Uh, I'll look it up while you talk. Okay. Okay. Sounds good. Um, okay, so apparently she didn't come up with it. She just took it and ran with it, which I guess makes a little bit more sense. Um, but anyway, she's a woman who has a conspiracy that ancient Rome didn't exist. Now, she uses that term pretty pretty boldly, and I think that a lot of people, at least when I first saw it, I interpret it as, like, if you go to Rome, the Colosseum won't be there. But she's not, like, talking about that. She's more, like, saying that, like, Rome as an idea didn't exist. Like, in the sense that there was no Latin language, all of the instances of the Latin language were forged by the church in the, like, 1500s as a way to, like, centralize power. Um, she believes that pretty much every Roman settlement we found was, like, either Greek or a part of some other civilization. Um, and every inscription we found there is in, you know, um, whatever their their native tongue is and not in Latin. And I don't think that there is an, a single person who will argue with you that the Roman Empire at its height was a homogeneous empire. Oh God. I don't think a single person will argue that. So in that sense, she's right. It was not homogeneous. But the fact that she claims that it like barely existed in its, I don't know, in its largest extent and that it didn't have the sphere of influence that it did is pretty terrible. Now, what makes it entirely worse is the fact that she has no degree, um, and she is incredibly abrasive. Um, I have had so many people come to me being like, her account got taken down, and I'll go and check it, and it wasn't. It's just because she goes through the comments of mine and Aiden's videos and will block every single person who comments on our videos because they are in support of us. I I do want to make it clear really quick, by the way. Um, Just, Uh... it's not, it's not that she doesn't have a degree, that bothers me because obviously you don't need a degree to talk about oh, history yeah. to find it interesting. And for a lot of people, a degree isn't an option. You know, you you don't have the money, you don't have the time, something like that. Uh, it's it's the fact that she a lies about having a degree, and then b it. is so aggressively rude towards people, even when they're not being rude back. Like when they'll just say something like, "Hey, can you explain this?" Uh, you know. And then to to go to the professor that you pointed out in your first video about it, um, and to be like, that's Greek. Are you all blind? When it's yeah. clearly Latin, um, like a, mm-hmm. that is our alphabet. That, like you're you're aware that that's our alphabet, yeah. right, ma'am? Um, <laughs> yeah, you do you do read English, right? You, you did that, you know. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so continue. Yes. She, she, so, so that, that's a, that's an excellent distinction to make, Aiden, is that the, um, you know, it's, it's the fact she says she has a degree, but doesn't. You do not need a degree in order to have passion and interest and your own theories and beliefs about something. But it's the fact that she says she does to get, like, clout and credit yeah. when she doesn't. Um, the thing which really prompted, for those of you who saw my initial video where I really, really laid into her, um, the thing that really prompted that was the fact that she um, was speaking to someone who is a PhD in classics in the way she was. Mm-hmm. Um, and I am a firm believer that you just having a degree does not necessarily make you, you know, some fucking genius. There are PhDs who are absolutely yeah. full of shit. Mm-hmm. Um, but there is, yeah. You, <laughs> there, you know what the fact, you know, <laughs> <laughs> you guys have something going on over there. Um, <laughs> but as a, a current... <laughs> what, do, do, did you guys go with, like, some terrible professor or something? No, there's there's a guy on... Uh, there's, there's this guy who's... Oh, boy. Uh, he's got his PhD in, I think, theology. Um, but... And he got it from, I think, Exeter. Uh, but he's a Mormon. And, um, and he talks... And I don't have a problem with being a Mormon and talking about Mormonism or being a theologian and talking about theology, but uh, he has a tendency to say just wildly incorrect or at the very least, like, non-mainstream things about the Bible as if they're fact. Uh, and, and it's that part, it's mm. the as if they're fact that really bugs me. 
Um, because yeah, yeah. people will ask questions. They'll be like, is it true that in the Bible, uh, the Israel, the Israelite forces are driven off by another deity? And he's like, well, thank you for the question. That is true. In fact, in second Kings, and then he just like, it is. So the exact passage says that, uh, the, the king of Moab. So God promises the Israelites that if they, uh, attack Moab, then God is going to deliver them victory. And one important context piece about the book of Kings, the first and second book of Kings, is that um, it's essentially the story of the Israelites just not trusting God over and over again and not listening to God and repeatedly screwing mm. up because of it. So that's the context of the book of Kings. Is it setting this up. It's setting you up for like the book of Judges um, and for the this this period where the, the Jews are undergoing a lot of different reforms in their government system and everything. Um, it's, it's a fascinating read, honestly. Uh, whether you're Christian or not, it's a very interesting like piece of kind of like theological history. But he says that uh, this one passage where it says that the, the king of Moab sacrificed his son um, on the walls to his deity. So the, the uh, Canaanite god uh, Chemosh. And he says that, um, you know, the, the king sacrificed his son and there was a divine fury from Moab and the Israelites uh, left. And this is all that it says. It doesn't say much. It, like, it, there's no, the Israelites were struck with fear, and it, it's not. Yeah. It's, so what they my, just yeah, out. <laughs> c contextually for me, the reading of that is, um, you know, there was, the, the king undertook this, like, supreme sacrifice of his son and heir, and the, you know, the clattering of the shields and the shaking of the spears and everything, and the, you know, m the Moabites being so spurred to... Uh, you know, this violent fervor by by this action being like, all right, well, if he can sacrifice his son, I can give my life. Like, I'm, I would rather mm -hmm. die than live under Israelite rule. Um, that's what I read it as. And he takes it and with absolutely zero um, supporting evidence says that, uh, well, actually this, this great fury, that's the, that's the, the wording that's used. He says, well, actually that's, that's divine fury and it's it's interesting because if you don't speak hebrew how are you going to argue with him because he he says he does so oh, that's God. his translation <laughs> that's his translation now keep in mind uh if you're using the king james version like like i do most of the time uh and as as we learned the uh the orthodox church uses mm -hmm. the king james version um the american orthodox church does uh so that's that was translated by people who spoke Hebrew, but he's saying they were wrong and he's right, um, and that it was actually divine fury that the god Kamash is in this instance in the Bible uh, confirmed to be a deity that the Israelites believed in. And I mean, if Isaiah forty five, uh, Deuteronomy I think thirty five, just all these different like um, bits and pieces in the Bible where it very explicitly says that God Yahweh Jehovah you know Alpha and Omega whatever he's the only God that the Israelites believe in. There are no other gods. Mm -hmm. It's not that he's the chief God. And the Bible is very clear about this. And um, whether you believe it or not, it is very clear. Um, mm -hmm. And so he he sits there and kind of like smugly with this like, you know, factual attitude says, yeah, so uh, I'm right. Every other scholar is wrong. And if you disagree with me, it's because you don't have a PhD and I do. Um, and then he blocked me. So, uh... <laughs> wow. Yeah, so... Ah, as any long good academic does. Long-winded way of saying, um... PhD doesn't make you, uh, Einstein. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a very, very good point. It does not, and I think a lot of the t not a lot of the time, but it has a tendency to also let it get to your head a little bit. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it gets to the point where if you get your PhD, you're like, well, now I just know everything. Mm -hmm. um, so it, you, you, you want to try and walk the line between, you know, um, being qualified and being an asshole. Exactly. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. Um, but anyway, the, the, the whole thing that really, I guess, got me about that is as, like, a current student in, in archaeology, it was... Uh, you know, it, it's it's shameful to see someone who not only is lying about their credentials in order to gain clout, but is then putting someone down who actually earned those credentials mm -hmm. and earned a far higher level. You, yeah. you need, what, like eight, nine years of education to earn a PhD yeah, in, like, highly specialized actual, work. Like, whether or not you do a, uh, a master's program, which you don't have to in a lot of fields, but... Yeah. Um, yeah, and, and like, that's specialized work, too. Yeah. 
so 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 seeing that is i think really what kind of riled up the, <laughs> the fire so so anyway for the, for those of you who are who are unaware um i've kind of put together a little bit of a task force of people um who are going to uh make a video that we can all kind of break down what she's saying um one of the things that someone pointed out, which I thought was fascinating, and, and you actually touched on briefly, Aiden, was the the idea of the 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 insults of like, oh, like, can, can you like see this? Are you blind? Mm -hmm. You know, you need to go see an eye doctor, or whatever. Which is petty childhood, yeah. you know, playground insults. It's it's embarrassing for an adult woman to be throwing those around in a scientific context. But beyond that, one of the people um, who I'm going to be having in these videos is a uh, a doctor from the. Um, uh, University of San Diego, I believe, right. and she was talking to me about her uh, research, which specializes in the Latin language. Um, so obviously, you know, she's very knowledgeable on it. And one of the things that she mentioned, um, which I thought was really interesting, was she was like, um, "It's really insulting to hear her say that because I have struggled very heavily with my vision since I was really young. Like mm -hmm. it was enough to like hold her back, like in school, and like she really struggled with it. Mm -hmm. So she was like, "This is like a huge hurdle I had to overcome in yeah. order to like." reach the same level as everyone else and she's here being like if you have this impairment you are not like qualified or able to see the same things i can and you know make the same deductive reasoning that i can and so it's really interesting to see someone who claims to like you know be doing all this to be like we're gonna throw off the shackles of like you know the yeah. old old ways of archaeology and we're gonna move into the progressive new age and then she's you know saying shit that's for lack of better terms horribly ableist um yeah that's exactly what i was that, gonna say is, yeah, yeah you know, it's exactly. for somebody who who is like trying so hard to represent herself as being this like progressive feminist like all these yeah. basically like she she's a walking buzzword um you know <laughs> yeah and uh but and then she goes and you know she says stuff that's ableist she says stuff that's anti-semitic she insults other women like I, i'm sitting there and i'm reading it and you know somebody came after me and uh stephen bell for you know ganging up on her when she's a woman and we're white men and i was like i feel like it would be more sexist to not gang up on her just because she's a woman. Uh, like, Absolutely. I'm, I'm approaching this as if you're a human. Um, so, like, but yeah, it, no, as you but should. But yeah, it's, you know, why, why would you, it's just hypocritical. Like, don't, don't present yourself as being this paragon of virtue and then put other people down, especially for immutable characteristics like their vision. <laughs> like, you, you can't, yeah, exactly. you didn't choose to be hard of sight. Like, you don't, you don't mm -hmm. choose to be deaf, you don't choose to be short, you don't choose to be tall. Like, it's just, yeah. Ugh. There are some people it, it's who pretty gross. actively disable themselves. Though. That is true. That's... <laughs> have you heard about that? The exception, I, I, I don't not know. the rule. Oh, God. There was... Yeah, with, with some exceptions there. I, I feel like the, the worst one the worst one that I've come across, and I'm, I'm, I'm trying to find a creator who I want to speak on this just because I'm not really one to represent it, um, but one of the things she said is she was like, um, she was like, I've been getting like a lot of questions on my videos, like, oh, why would the church like do this to like you know white people or mm -hmm. whatever? And then she was like, did you really think that them going over to the like the Americas and wiping out two continents of indigenous people with their first rodeo? And I was like, okay, so you are comparing <laughs> your conspiracy that the church invented Latin to the fact that there were like just the most atrocious fucking genocide of two continents. <laughs> You're comparing those two things, like those are equitable, and also the fact that she says that, like, oh, they she they wiped out two continents, like they're still fucking they're here. Still here. Like, don't don't act like don't fucking undermine the culture and the horror that they experience by being like they're wiped out. Like, oh, that damn church. Like, they are still fucking here. It's it's really really Wait, embarrassing to like. Which like, yeah, it's I, I mean, as a as a student of history, I am enormously impressed with the staying power of the indigenous populations of the Americas and the fact that they have God bless. Yeah. Fought, fought through everything they've fought through because there are a lot of specific tribes and peoples that I could point to from European history who did not survive. Um, one, of the, one of the best mm -hmm. examples is actually, um, I guess, something she wouldn't believe actually happened, but the, the, uh, what Dan Carlin calls the Celtic Holocaust, uh, the, the Roman mm -hmm. invasion of Gaul. And the subsequent just complete destruction of Gallic culture. Uh, you know, by, by the time the Roman Empire was falling, there wasn't a Gallic revival. When the Roman Empire left Britain, there was a distinct uh, Brythonic Celtic revival. They started worshipping their old gods. They start, started speaking uh, proto, not proto, uh, uh, what's the word? Um, they basically started speaking, you know, ancient Welsh. Uh, and... Mm. You know, they went back to their hill forts and left the cities and basically just took up exactly the culture they had had 400 years before the Romans left. 
Um, so it, it, imagine if um, every everyone who came to the Americas from somewhere else, if they just left, and the Native Americans went back to speaking their own languages and uh, you know living in their old style cities, uh, their old style towns. You know, if you went from like living in uh, you know, a lot of a lot of natives today live in typical American houses, uh, you know, very, very much have assimilated into um, kind of the very interesting melting pot that is American culture. But uh, yeah, imagine, like, going back to wigwams and teepees and longhouses now. That's that's what you're looking at yeah. with, with the Celt with the Roman withdrawal from Britain, and that's what happened with the Brythonic Celtic peoples. Mm -hmm. is they, and Gildas talks about it a lot in uh, The Ruin of Britain. But, um, you know, that... With Gaul, that didn't happen. Uh, and Gaul was only under Roman control about 150 years longer than uh, than Britain was. So you, you look at something like that, like that was a, a group of people who never recovered. And the same kind of thing happened in Spain. Um, similar things happened in, in Greece. It took Greece a very long time, uh, partially because it was under the control of the Byzantines, but um, it took Greece a very long time to regain kind of its national identity. And with a lot of the Native American people in America, Today, it's they, they've managed to preserve their culture and their teachings and their religions and their languages, and it's it's truly an incredible thing to look at. And then for her to just go and say that the Catholic Church completely wiped out native culture is oh yeah, first it's of all, horribly it's insulting, fascinatingly yeah. wrong, but also like mm -hmm. extremely insulting for a, a group of people who have you know, put up with so much and managed to persevere culturally. It's it's truly incredible. Just a heads up, where and, and it, it's on. very. It, it's like also dismissive of the fact that these people not only are they like still here and like have a very rich culture and tradition which they've managed to persist despite the best attempts of the atrocities that were committed against them but also the fact that they are still experiencing like you know a, a, a plethora of unique issues are part of the snowball effect mm -hmm. of those very atrocities that they experienced you know generations ago yeah. so by being like oh like you know they, they were they were wiped out it's like they're still here they're still you know exist as a culture and they are still really struggling like don't just like wipe it under the rug like they, there's still like a huge need for change in this yeah. country um so it's 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 an interesting i guess uh, dichotomy when she tries to be so progressive and exactly. then comes across just unbelievably problematic yeah. so it's it's horrible but well since we're on this topic of native americans i think that's a great way to transition into uh that second topic we want to talk about which is the clovis culture. <laughs> i forgot we had an itinerary <laughs> i didn't i didn't it, it does tend to happen on it the does show, tend so to happen don't, yeah don't worry too much so we're gonna we're gonna this is something that we can i think talk about pretty easily uh, and rather quickly and i want to oh. i do definitely want to hit um the younger dryas and atlantis and Quebec tepe and all that really quick to, oh yeah, we'll yeah, we'll get to it. Definitely we'll get to it. that. You know, we we might go a little bit past eight thirty. It's fine. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So um, we got nowhere to be. Yeah. So for those for those who are not, um, you know, in in the know about uh, Clovis, uh, Clovis, New Mexico was a site where they discovered a bunch of spear tips and arrowheads that all had a very distinct shape. Um, and this is they were able to date these uh, in many cases to about thirteen thousand years ago. Um, and this spurred a phenomenon, a, a way of thinking in the archaeological and historical community known as Clovis First. And this has become the standard for when America was uh, populated by people crossing over the land bridge in the Bering Strait into the Americas. And for a very long time, it's been kind of the, that's the thing. That's, that's when people came to America. And it's become a bit problematic because there are people who challenge it and they are immediately dismissed. Um, I, I see asking questions as a good thing personally. Um, but I know that it also does tend to be the cause of certain conspiracies. A lot of people say that, uh, the original native Americans were white, like the Mormons do, um, which is not Jesus true. Mm. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it, it's one of those things we'll that like put a pin in that one. Yeah. It's like, Important question to ask. Uh, immediately gets taken and just thrown into some really weird stuff. But uh, you know what's oh, yeah. so coming coming from the archaeological background. Uh, do, how do you feel about Clovis first um, as as a doctrine essentially? So so 
the idea of Clovis culture is really interesting to me because it's very unique as far as other cultures around the world because it's an entire kind of group that is being denoted just by one tool. Yeah. We don't know a lot about the Clovis civilization. In fact, when you say Clovis culture, you aren't really talking about a, a culture in the same way of like, you know, ancient Greek culture or like, you know, uh, like Celtic culture. Mm. It's kind of this idea of like a culture of like a tradition um, that is found all across the new world. So I, I think it's widely believed that many of these groups did have their own very unique practices, but this one tool is kind of the only thing that's really left behind. Um, and so there is obviously the whole idea of, you know, they kind of denote when um, humanity migrated into the new world. Um, but that has been challenged very recently. I don't know. I, I made a video talking about it. I don't know if you've stumbled across this, but they actually made a discovery that pushes back the mm -hmm. arrival of uh, mankind in the new world by 10,000 uh, yeah, years. I, I actually did. Yeah. And I made a video about it when it came out. When you put your yes. video up. Yeah. There we go. Yeah. I don't, I don't oh, think good. I stitched yeah. it because yours was three minutes long. So I like had to do the yeah, you can't thing. Stitch him, unfortunately. But um, yeah, when you, when you put that video out, I didn't say so that, and I actually opened it with saying that it was good that those feet were dateable, um, because that would please a subset of my audience. Uh, <laughs> which was the entire that's reason. A, that's a good that line. was the whole reason I made the video was to make that joke. Uh, but yeah, I was talking about. It. I was like, that's, that's fascinating. Like, because because that really does it begs the question. You know, especially given some of the climactic events that happened around thirteen thousand years ago. I. Uh, you know, being able to date that even further back is very interesting. Um, you know, what, cause, cause, oh, yeah. Because we, I don't think we've dated anything Clovis related that far back. Because you can't, no, you the, can't the date oldest stone Clovis that points. Way. Yeah. So the oldest Clovis point found, I believe, was from Texas, and it was uh, dated to be around 9,000 years old, mm -hmm. I think. Um, and again, was part of the reason why, when, or part of the, the uh, you know, evidence of when humanity arrived in the New World. Mm -hmm. um, and it wasn't actually dated as a stone itself. It was dated from, I believe, a camp, uh, like yeah. a fire pit or something right. that was found nearby. Um, so it's always a little bit iffy dating stone tools anyway. You kind mm -hmm. of have to rely on context clues. Um, but yeah, it, it's fascinating. The idea of those footprints, you know, not to, not to build off that too much farther, but, you know, the, uh, the, the, the footprint discovery is not only, you know, fascinating because it pushes back the, the idea of how long humans have been in the New World for. For those of you who don't know, um, previously it was widely accepted that um, people migrated across, you know, the Bering Land Bridge um, in around, around 13,000 to 11,000 years ago. Um, but this uh, discovery was dated to be about 23,000 years old. And it was dated by finding uh, seeds that were carbon datable that were pressed into the bottom of the footprint. So, you know, they were deposited at the same time. And these footprints were found all the way in New Mexico, which is like the southern U.S. So it wasn't mm -hmm. just like up by the, you know, Aleutian Islands. It was all the way in the bottom. So that's pretty interesting. But not only, as I think you kind of um, touched on, Aiden, about the uh, you know climatic uh, things that were going on then, was um, this also helps us kind of narrow down how mankind may have migrated into the New World. Um, because the uh, ice-free corridor would not have been as open or passable uh, 23,000 years ago. So it lends a lot more credibility to the kelp highway theory that humanity kind of traveled along the coast using um, resource-rich kelp beds as a uh, source of food. Um, which supports something that I've, I've believed for a while, which is that there were obviously multiple waves of migration. I don't think it's reasonable to expect that there was just one big group came over, populated the world, and then no one else came across. So I do still think that the ice-free corridor was probably used around 10,000 years ago before you know the sea level rose too mm -hmm. much and the island for chain formed. Um, but it's pretty interesting that those those seeds that were found have such a ripple effect in the idea of the colonization of the new world um, that you know it kind of changes the theory um, of, of how we actually got here, which is pretty amazing. So. Yeah, I, I agree. It's, it, it, that was one of those things that like when, when you came out with that, I, I felt vindicated because <laughs> I've been arguing. <laughs> I've been saying for a little while right. now, I've been saying for a little while now, it's like, I really just feel like 13,000 years can't be the, the longest uh, time period based on a, a bunch of yeah. stuff that I've talked about. Um, oh, yeah. But it was, so when that came out, I was like, oh, finally. <laughs> Uh, was right. This this actually came out between that whole thing that happened with Archaea Wolf um, mm. and uh, and recently uh, Morris Keen um, on on TikTok and I don't know if he is on YouTube or not. Uh, I don't know if you know any of his content, but he, uh, he and I, I got they're, they're a bit of a part tiff. of the. Uh, the... Oh, yeah. you did. Well, you're yeah. gonna have an interesting time because he's gonna be sitting at our table with the archaeology. So, so the, uh, personally, the thing. <laughs> personally, I I I was caught off guard um, by by what he said to me. Um, cause I followed him. I, I, I followed him. I was like, so I was just a little, I, neat. 
I think he was going through. I think he was going through it, and I uh, just kind of snapped on me. Um, young guy, easy target. Uh, saying some rather happens, rather out there stuff. I I have no hard feelings towards him. I would happily, you know, good. I would happily make up. I uh, you know, but um, he's actually been tagged a lot in my recent videos. <laughs> it's really funny. <laughs> but yeah, but yeah, I, I think you'll redeem it. Yeah, I figured he might be involved in uh in your, and also back yeah. then I wasn't making quite as much of the uh the historical content. I was very focused on the like supernatural stuff. Um uh, that would so, do it. <laughs> so I think that you know, not seeing any of the actual his, historical credentials that I have might have also um caused a bit of a problem there. But yeah, I don't I don't Fair have enough. any hard feelings. You know, it's water under the bridge. But I uh, yeah, so um what were we talking about? Clovis culture. Clovis uh, culture. Yes. The world. So I, I was th that that came out between that little uh, tiff and now, and I was like, one in the win column. Uh, finally, let's go. Let's go. But yeah. So I, uh, you know, I think this, you know, and obviously I made a video a few days ago where I talked about uh, the the Topper site and the Saruti Mastodon site, um, and how those obviously not uh, quite quite the level of finding a seed impressed into a footprint, but I, uh, you know, push th those respectively, I, uh, you know, St Topper pushes it back to 50,000 and Saruti to 130,000, which Saruti is very, very like thin because it's, it and, you know, it's basically a, a chip and a mastodon bone that looks like it was made with a stone tool. Um, you know, yeah, that's so, 150,000 is that, I would, yeah. I would say that's a stretch, at least it's yeah. just an opinion based thing. That seems pretty, it's wow. definitely it, it's definitely it's one of those things that I'm like that deserves a question. It deserves to be filed yeah. under interesting. Let's Absolutely, talk about it. Yeah, but it it's not like the kind of thing where you can look at that and be like, oh yeah, that's humans were here 130. No, it's not. It's yeah. not set in stone. Uh, Topper I think is more more intriguing um, because it's it's got some actual organic matter that's datable and um, that you know it's a little bit more. I, it's still stone tools that don't necessarily have to be. Homo sapiens sapiens stone tools. Um, mm -hmm. They could be anything from Erectus habilis, Neanderthalus, Denisovans. Um, so we don't know for sure, but it's very interesting to have, you know, uh, tool making hominids 50,000 years ago. Um, and, oh, yeah. And, you know, it, with, with, with that in mind, I think it's a, a good segue into uh, that, that final topic, which is the, the cataclysmic event of the 12,800 year mark to the 11,600 year mark uh, years ago, which is the Younger Dryas period, which is the one that I have seen the most uh, debate and the most argumentation over because it is peer-reviewed research that this this happened. Um, the, the exact team being uh, James Kennett, a PhD in marine geology, Alan West, PhD in geophysics, at geophysics, uh, Richard Firestone, PhD in, B, uh, PhD in nuclear science, James Whitkey, PhD in geology, Albert Goodyear, PhD in archaeology. So, and along with I think twenty four other scientists who are all involved in this project, uh, dating the uh, the impact in Greenland that they believe led to the Younger Dryas. The Younger Dryas, of course, being this period of cooling around twelve thousand eight hundred years ago, mild cooling, relatively which uh, lasts about 1,200 years and then culminates in a very rapid uh, warming period. And this happens to, you know, I'm, I'm just going to go through this really quick so that we can kind of yeah. talk through it. But yeah, so uh, prior to the Younger Dryas discovery, we, we kind of believed that there was no room in human history for an extinction-level event. Um, you know, it was the Paleolithic, the Mesolithic, and the Neolithic, and then we had, you know, the ancient humanity, ancient Sumeria, all of that. Um, and so this kind of threw a wrench in that. And of course, uh, something that's brought up by, and here's where we're going to get into some, some names that people aren't going to like, uh, Graham Hancock brings this up a lot. Um, let's the, go in the <laughs> approximately 27 hours of footage of him on Joe Rogan's show, which, whew, oh, um, Jesus. and of course that, when it's Joe Rogan, of words just gave me vertigo, yeah, Joe, Joe Rogan, you know, I think he is a fantastic podcast host because he will really sit there and talk about anything with anyone. That is fair. I yeah. I am very entertained by his program. Um, and I've, I've learned some interesting stuff from very credible people. I've also heard some very non-credible people say some very 
convincing things and then gone and looked it up and been like, hold on a second. Um, you know? Wow, that's bullshit. <laughs> uh, and of yeah. course, the, the, the memes that came out of the Alex Jones appearance in 2018 were just like, oh, chef's kiss. Um, some truly incredible memes. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's Tim fair. What? Did you see the recent Tim Pool show? I didn't. I know, I know he just did a show with Tim Pool. Uh, I, need yeah. to, I need to watch that one. Yeah, um, there, I didn't watch all of it. I watched like five minutes of it, but that is a group. Oh, people. oh, the one with, it was Joe Rogan, Alex Jones, Blair White, Tim Pool, Luke Radowski. Oh, yeah. my God. Good I, God. Yeah. <laughs> and they're all in his RV? Is, is that in they're, in, they're in Luke's RV. <laughs> like, uh, I think Blair White's in there. Yeah, she is. Yeah. Um, so, it, whew, just big, big group of people. But, uh, yeah. yeah, so getting back into the, the overdrives thing. So part, part of the issue here was that, uh, that Graham Hancock brings up that I think is interesting, and I think it's one of his more salient points, is that I... Uh, you know, the Younger Dryas event, these guys hit a lot of criticism from the archaeological community when they first put forward the theory, much like uh, Alvarez et al. back when they put forward the, uh, the um, KT event theory. And then, of course, the, the KT, the, the Cretaceous Tertiary event, um, which is the, the extinction of the dinosaurs 65 million, 66 million years ago. Yeah. Um, 65, I think, yeah. Yeah. Uh, that, that initially was scorned. They, they were you know, laughed out of conferences over it. And then, sure enough, um, I think it was in the 90s, we discovered the crater. Uh, and they were they were vindicated. Um, and so yep. the, the Younger Dryas team faced a very similar um, issue at first when they first put the theory forward. And this, this is peer-reviewed science. This is mainstream. What's not peer-reviewed science and what's not mainstream is the 11,600 date. And that's when the warnings shows up. So... We have an idea that comet impact in Greenland caused kind of a nuclear winter cooling, cooling effect. Um, and then uh, 11,600 years later, it's uncertain. Some people have suggested, well, maybe it was a comet fragment that hit the water. Maybe it was uh, in another impact somewhere else that for some reason caused a warming effect. That's not settled science. That's not something that's, you know, anyone's certain of. But what we do find that's interesting is where that segues into... Uh, you know, out of geology, out of climatology, and into um, archaeology and anthropology, which is 11,600 years ago, what, what happens? Well, we have uh, the story of Atlantis, the founding of Atlantis, which is, or not founding of Atlantis, the sinking of Atlantis, which is uh, Plato recounts in several of his works that one of his ancestors, the, the great Solon of Athens, went to Egypt, spoke to the Egyptians, they told him about Atlantis, he said, when did this happen? This was 600 BC. He said, when did this happen? They said, 9,000 years ago. 9,000 years ago in 600 BC is 9,600 BC, which of course is 11,600 years ago, and Graham Hancock's point on this is, if Plato made it up, he was astoundingly spot on. Um, so mm -hmm. maybe... So the argument there is like maybe there was some sort of like oral tradition passed down that recounted this time of this this cataclysmic event, and then at the same time as you get the story about uh, as you have the younger Dryas uh, ending and, and the climate heating up and Atlantis supposedly sinking, you get Gebethli Tepe being built in Turkey, and you know when I look at all these things that my 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 more so what what I like to do more than anything is I'm a fiction author. <laughs> So my that that side of me is like, oh come on, <laughs> like that's and, and I wrote I wrote I wrote a movie last year. I wrote a movie, a feature length film. It's 130 pages of script. It is a full feature length film, and somebody in Hollywood buy it. It's really good. It's like kind of a national treasure, like um, like Indiana Jones <laughs> style thing. It. Yeah, it's as, great. As somebody who's currently in the works of getting a script sold, uh, I can confirm that from a screenwriting standpoint, it's a very good story. See? It's a very interesting story, and it's a part one of three. Yeah, exactly. I've got plans for sequels. Like, you know, someone. I'll, I'll take it right now. How much you want? <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. I'll take, uh, I, I don't know, like $27 would probably do it. I can probably do that. Uh, point is, point is um, just very interesting, you know, uh, confluence of events. Uh, so all these things that are happening at the same time, how much is coincidence? How much is uh, a lost chapter of history? And, and I personally, I do lean in this specific case on the lost chapter of history side. Um, it Possibly because I'm more of a historian than I am an archaeologist. Uh, so for me, I'm mm -hmm. I'm looking at kind of like the 
the documents and the stories. And I, I know archaeologists like to have, uh, you know, hard, like, um, you know, analyzing, analyzing actual artifacts is, is the practice of archaeology. For, for me as a historian, I'm like, let's get the documents and, you know, let's, let's see Plato's business card. Um, you know, let's... I, I want the receipts. Yeah, so so I look at it that way, and I think that, you know, at the very least, it's worth asking the question, you know, are we missing something? But, I, uh, you know, as far as, for me, I look at Gobekli Tepe, and, like, the fact that Gobekli Tepe is being built around the first time that we're seeing agriculture in uh, Europe and Asia... Oh, yeah. ...is, is very fascinating, because it's kind of a chicken-and-egg situation, and to yep. me, I look at it, and I, I personally think Gobekli Tepe's first, and I think, you know... I, I obviously can't prove this. Um, I will not yeah. pretend that this is something I can prove. But what I'm looking at is I want to see the research into was Gebekli Tepe created by a group of people who survived this cataclysmic event. And they built this and they brought agriculture. And then eventually over time, you know, it they... I, I don't want to like make it into this might sound a little bit like eugenics, but I promise it's not. Um, <laughs> I am not That's a eugenicist. A great way to uh, anything. You just put that on the list. Yeah, the record on the t-shirt. <laughs> every, every show we have to add in a new disclaimer um, yeah. about like, you know, I am not a fed. I am not a eugenicist. Like, um, but no. So I, you know, what if we had this group of people from a culture that was rather advanced? Again, when I say advanced, I don't mean aliens. I mean like, you know, yeah. Aztecs in 1500 is what I'm talking yeah, about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, did we have a group of people who somehow survived this flooding event that would have, you know, I, we know that at the end of the year of the driest, the, the sea levels rose 500 to 600 feet because of the glacial melt, and the meltwater pulse 1B, um, and that, you know, this would have, if that happened today, it would bury almost every single major city on Earth um, under yep. underwater. So if that happened then perhaps there were a group of people that survived and built this, this you know, complex at Gebekli Tepe, which uh, is Turkish for potbelly hill because it looks to be a very deliberately covered in round hill. Um, and that, you know, that, that's kind of where, where this, this new agricultural thing started. And over time, you know, just like how the, the Romans lost a lot of what made the Roman over the course of uh, the fall of the West to the fall of Byzantium. Um, you know, maybe we witnessed a similar thing over the course of a thousand years from 11,600 to about 10,600. So, uh, you know, obviously very long winded, but I want to make sure everyone understands what I'm saying here. Uh, what, what do you, so I got to ask, you know, you're, you're the debunking conspiracies guy. You, you are the guy. Um, so so let's, <laughs> tell me what you think, man. <laughs> Firstly, firstly, um, I, I gotta say, it's qu quite something to hear th that I am the guy for anything. That's, that's quite impressive. So I, I appreciate the, the unofficial title. Um, I suppose, so, so I definitely do have some areas where I am more than willing to be like, I am going to go full out, like, I'm gonna just speculate, and maybe it's true. I have no reason to back it up, but it might be true. Um, so I guess, firstly, I should preface by saying that, you know, while, while you have your kind of you know, medieval Roman kind of era mm. of history that you're really fascinated by. Um, and kind of the reasons that you just stated are the reasons why I am personally really fascinated by uh, Neolithic and post-glacial history, mm. because it is something that we just do not know about. And it's so fascinating to try and think, like the people who lived then were exactly the same developmentally as all of us right mm. here. The only difference is the knowledge that we have, as far as we know. Yep. Um, and so like, th th that is fascinating to think that people just like us were living back then. Um, so... I would say that, in my opinion at least, without a shadow of a doubt, there was some sort of flood event that happened. Yes. I don't think that it was on the scale of, you know, the biblical stories of the whole world being covered. I, I, I don't even think that it was something uh, to the extent of, I don't know, like a major civilization being wiped out mm. like Atlantis. But the, the, the idea of a flood crops up so many times in so many stories that I think that you know, I, I'm a firm believer in the fact that every legend comes from somewhere. Mm -hmm. Every, you know, every story of a Wendigo or a skinwalker comes from a bump <laughs> in the dark in the woods. You know, every, every every idea of, you know, where how are the pyramids built come from the, you know, like, wait, how do they move these stones? And you just can can run from there. So I'm, I'm a firm believer that the there had to be some sort of event like that. Um, 
I mean, it goes all the way back to my one of, I mean, I guess the the, the archaeological text of the Epic of Gilgamesh, uh, mm-hmm. you know, contains a, a flood story, which is the first, not only the first story, but the first flood story. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I do think that there could be something, if you want to get a little bit um, ethereal with it, the idea that there is something kind of poetic in the idea that all of these civilizations were around water. Water was something that is, it's, it's our life force. It's all of the agrarian life. society yeah. needed water. Exactly. And so I think that there is something to be said for not only may, there being a flood in the past, but the idea of the very thing which gives you life being the thing which can snuff it out. Exactly. So I think that that may have been a little bit of kind of a metaphor as well. Um, but yeah, I do fully believe that. Um, as for the chicken and egg um, scenario that you were talking about, is uh, that that's kind of an interesting one that I was thinking about because the I know there's been a lot of speculation um, that that site was built um, and the agrarian society remains that they found around it were made in order to sustain the workers that were needed to build mm-hmm. it which I think is very interesting because if, you know, the the hill construction needed that many people, you yeah. would need to feed them and house them and all that. Um, so I do like the that's, idea. That's one of those things where, like, you'd have to have a rather developed agrarian society at that point, wouldn't you? Oh, I, I would I would absolutely say so. Um, to be able to have that many people that, like, centralized that they would go through the effort of building... What, I mean, it's the first megalithic structure. It's an unbelievable construction. Mm-hmm. And it was made in, I believe it was 9,000... Is it 9,000 BC? 9,000 BC? Something uh, like that? Yeah, some, um, I don't know if it was 9,000 years yeah. ago. It's, yeah. it's about so 11,500, it, 11,600 years ago. Okay. So then 9,000 BC, I guess it it would be correct. So yeah, so it's like an unbelievably old structure. And the other thing which is pretty interesting about it is, um, you know, if we're we're looking at it from like an artistic standpoint, is the depictions on the stones. So yeah, so I'm sure that you know this this could definitely be a cause for a lot of conspiracy as well. Mm-hmm. So in in a lot of Neolithic artwork, you see uh, lots of depictions of animals which we interpret as being animals that would be hunted. There's not a lot mm-hmm. of predators. There's a lot of you know like uh, different types of horses and you know like uh, deer and things like that. Oxen and it's theorized nice. that it was used. To... Absolutely, yeah. So you see a lot of that, especially in like Glasgow Cave in France and all that. Um, but the interesting thing about the uh, Gobekli Tepe site is that it has the uh, carvings and uh, depictions of like giant snakes and yep. spiders and like monsters and lions and all this like crazy shit, which is like amazing. It's absolutely fascinating to see uh, because you don't really see depictions like that up until that point. So it leads to the idea that these people, not only are they going through the effort of creating a sacred ceremonial site, theoretically, but there is now this development of artistic expression for the purpose of artistic expression, yeah. not for the sole purpose of survival. Like these people needed, they didn't have to worry about, you know, putting food on the table so much that they, you know, had to put all their time into it because mm-hmm. they had crops. They had free time. They could be yeah. like, well, we have all of our food right here. We don't have to migrate with the herds. So they could put all this effort into using this bad yeah. boy uh, and, you know, making making all this stuff. So it's a, it's a fascinating site. It's really, really interesting. Yeah, um, and and that one thing that really strikes me about that site specifically is is the way you've get you've got depictions of like every kind of animal and also some animals, if I remember correctly, uh, that aren't necessarily native to the region, um, which which is one of the question marks. Uh, you know, it, it could be that they at that time that you had those animals there, uh, but um, and it, that's you know obviously that's up for your interpretation. These are not you know. You're not looking at like photorealistic paintings. Um, you're, you're looking yeah. at, you know, not crude carvings, but they're still carvings. Um, yeah, there's they're Ooh. still ancient depictions. Uh, but in a lot of the stories from that region, uh, especially in uh, Judeo-Christian, um, you know, uh, the the origin story, you know, Genesis, um, as well as the Zoroastrian tradition, you have that same bit about uh, the animals two by two. Um, to to oh. each animal, so that that's in both Christianity, Judaism, Ooh. Judeo-Christian uh, theology, as well as Zoroastrian, which is from Persia. So that's another interesting hmm. thing that you've got these depictions of all these animals, and then you've got two major religions in the area that both have this story of uh, you know preserving the animals and how much Damn, is al- that's how, interesting. How much is allegory? How much is you know? literal but it's it's one of those things that you look at and you're like hmm it, it things that make you go hmm 
Um, <laughs> yeah, no, that's 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 absolutely a very hmm. And you know, if if I wanted to give that sort of the idea of the the water as a metaphor kind of treatment with that, mm. it's the idea of you know, if we're going off of tr traditional biological views, is you know, in order to reproduce, there is a male and female, mm. and that is what's needed to like carry on the, uh, the, yeah. the the species. So you could go off of that in the sense that it's like you know. In order to, you know, let's say they're going off the Great Flood story, which everyone seems to like, and then it's like, well, what do you need in order to repopulate life? Because at the end of your story, you want a happy ending. Yeah. It's like, well, there was there was two of each, you know. Obviously, ignoring the horrible genetics that would occur from it, yeah. uh, you know, is that. Um, but but I do think that you know, if we're then going to lend credibility to the idea of a flood, there could be something to be said for that. Um, even if it was on a smaller scale than the whole world being destroyed, you know, maybe it like it could be anything as mundane as this guy who lost his whole. Be. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. Like it, it could be, it could be anything. So yeah. you know, I, I think that every, every legend, every story, every fable comes from somewhere based in reality. Yeah. So. So just b before we go to super chats, um, which we're we're about to do, but since you just said every legend, every fable has some basis in reality, I think what what the people you got want me. to hear, <laughs> what the people want to hear is the the flesh pedestrians um okay. you know, <laughs> where how real is this thing that we're talking about and um i, I look so, at native americans take this extraordinarily seriously um to, to the extent where i i have gotten some hate uh from <laughs> from some indigenous folks i've also gotten some very supportive feedback uh I, i'd say it's probably 90 percent supportive because um, I do, I do reach out to you know uh, Navajo and Algonquin and Ojibwe, and I, I try to get like the as much of the original story as I can, so that I can then compare it and contrast it with you know what what the pop culture version is. Um, I had a yeah. very negative opinion of the movie Antlers for exactly that reason, <laughs> um, because they were like, we're gonna make a movie that's very you know pro native, but we're gonna ignore all of their folklore. Um, yeah, I think I saw your video about yeah. that. <laughs> you had a lot to say. <laughs> so, um, uh, but uh, yeah, so for me, I look at it, I, I do genuinely, I talk about a lot of stuff that I don't believe in. Mm -hmm. um, and I try to s create the suspension of disbelief by not saying specifically what I believe in and what I don't. And, you know, it's, I'm, not course, quite, yeah. I'm not quite playing a character, but I'm like, you know, trying to create an atmosphere, I guess, is the best way to yeah, put it. Yeah, you want to keep it interesting. Yeah, exactly. Um but with with the idea of like uh, you know the the uncanny valley and things like uh, the legend of the Wendigo, the legend of the Skinwalker, um, you know these these various Native American um, folk legends. While they're obviously not exactly the same, they have a lot of similarities in certain contexts. So I think this comes from somewhere, and whether that is from um, you know the, obviously the the really uh, you know out their view to look at is, you know, well, we have the uncanny valley effect and all these stories of these, uh, you know, superhuman apex predators, because back in the darker days of humanity, when we were, you know, just starting to get on our feet as, as a civilized species, um, there was something that hunted us, something that looked kind of like us, but was stronger and faster, um, all the way down through, you know, stuff that's as mundane as, you know, maybe there were, cannibal cults that were roaming around mm -hmm. and this caused that story so for me i and i find also the the um the aspect where in a lot of stories of uh european and near east um you know mythologies you have these superhuman creatures that eat human beings um you know for example like the jotnar in norse mythology uh, mm -hmm. And then in the Judeo-Christian tradition, you have the the Nephilim, and this does differ between Judaism and Christianity a little mm -hmm. bit. Um, you know whether or not you acknowledge the Book of Enoch as canonical, deuterocanonical, or completely apocryphal, um, which uh, I think deuterocanonical is probably the best description of the Book of Enoch. But um, the Church disagrees with me. Uh, at least the first Book of Enoch. Um, but so, and the Book of Enoch talks about uh, the Watchers and the Nephilim and the the angels who were tasked with uh guiding humanity and watching humanity um essentially becoming jealous and coming down and creating their own breed of civilization acting as overlords and then having the the offspring of the the watchers and the humans and these were the nephilim and these you know were these giants and these superhuman um beings and these you know these great men as they're described 
and uh, great being more of a descriptor of stature than, um, you know, quality, so to speak. Uh, so, and you know, he's a great and, guy. Yeah, and then and then you have the the flood directly after this concept is introduced. Oh yeah. Uh, so and, and it's basically the way I read Genesis is you know, the the watchers come down, they have kids with humans. These kids are extraordinarily problematic. Um, and God is like, that wasn't supposed to happen, flood. Uh, and then so, and then I look at it, I'm like, well, what if some of them survived? And what if some of them survived and made it over to the Americas? And what if, you know, these, these half-breed humans that are, you know, superhuman, what if they, over the years and over the ages of being isolated, became these um, less than human monsters with the, this more than human capability. Uh, and that's where we get things like the, the idea of the Wendigo and the Jotnar and certain demigods and whatnot. So I, I obviously I can't prove anything that I'm saying, uh, mm. <laughs> but I think it's a very interesting, uh, you know, interesting way to look at something that we don't have evidence of in a, a mm -hmm. fossil record, but there is a pretty long, um, literary and oral and folk t folkloristic tradition um so what, what like i i'm curious to know what your thoughts are on that that phenomenon yeah know, where all this comes from obviously what's going on you know pop culturally is uh a complete bastardization but <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> So, so that, I mean, that's a great question, and I think you 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 raise a good point again in talking about the idea that this, um, you know, piece piece of folklore, this piece of mythos has occurred independently so many times over so many different cultures and civilizations mm -hmm. all around the world. I mean, the the idea of if we're just going to focus on the idea of like superhuman something that like like cannibalism cannibalism is something that i feel like is a very common trend when it comes mm. to these stories um you know indicative of the superhuman that looks sort of human will come with the whole oh they they eat people kind of deal yeah and you can find that everywhere from indigenous mythology um i know you know the obvious one that comes to mind is the giants of lovelock cave um and you know of course even in, in pop culture you know there's story what well, like Hansel and gretel were like mm -hmm. gonna be eaten by the witch or you know even in, in like modern things where there's um uh what was that movie a uh, green inferno and stuff like that mm -hmm. that whole idea of of cannibalism is something which really strikes a chord with us mm -hmm. and i would hazard a guess that some of that is just because it's the idea of kind of like you know we we, we are somehow above that like we are not livestock yeah, we are we're so wrong people and yeah it's so wrong. Yeah, exactly. That that is like the ultimate thing. Like it it is. I mean, even there is the idea of it's so wrong that I I believe it's the is the Skinwalker is mm -hmm. uh, a person who has eaten human flesh and becomes you know yes. an, like so they lose their soul. No, and, and that's, that is something that's, that's actually Wendigo. Um, that's a Wendigo. Okay, yeah, so, okay, thank you. I got yeah, the extra just, here. <laughs> just a really quick. Uh, that's yeah. that's one of the. Um, but yeah, the the big difference that's noted in in the pop cultural stuff, but that is rooted in the native folklore itself, is that. Uh, skinwalkers are doing it deliberately. Um, they have chosen to uh, consume, um, and this, by the way, I found out recently from a another Navajo person, um, another individual who's part of the Navajo tribe, uh, that the cannibalism aspect is not universal uh, with skinwalkers mm. in Navajo uh, culture. Um, I don't know how not universal it is. I don't have like proportions here for who believes what and what numbers. But they said that the cannibalism thing was news to them, and they're from from the Navajo tribe. Uh, wow. Yeah, which I I was caught off guard. I was like, oh, and of course I, my reaction was to um, throw that disclaimer into anything when I talk about this. You know, this is not universal amongst the. Sounds because, like we made an, up, an update video. Yeah, we might need an update video because of course I, I learned this <laughs> immediately after our Skinwalker YouTube video goes up. Um, it but, ain't yeah. that the way. Yeah, right. yeah. So the the Skinwalker aspect is I. Uh, in terms of the cannibalism, when it does occur, is that they have to consume a close friend or family member, and they are doing it for the purpose of gaining these supernatural powers. With the Wendigo ah. situation, um, and this is also centered primarily around winter. It's from the northern regions. Um, you know, they they tend to appear in the winter and not in the in the summer. Um, but it is a person. Th there's a couple of different versions of this, uh, depending on where you go, which tribe. Uh, but it spans the entire, like, Appalachians and then west of there. Uh, and the idea is if you become desperate and out of desperation you resort to cannibalism, then you the lose Donner your The Donner Party! <laughs> Donner Party gets brought up a lot with that. Um, 
Oh yeah. For good reason. But yeah, so it, exactly. So you know, out of desperation, you become a cannibal. You become a Wendigo. There's also the version of the Wendigo story where it's actually a, a demonic presence that will infest a person, mm. possess a person, uh, make them crave human flesh. Those are the two biggest versions of it. And each tribe has their varying like, you know, bit to bit. And in some cases, you know, it, some tribes report that they grow in proportion to their last meal. Um, and some, so you could have like thirty foot tall Wendigo. Um, in some versions, they uh, the only way to kill them is to uh, you know burn them. In some versions, you have to rip out their heart and burn their heart. In some cases, their heart is actually uh, made out of ice, and you have to melt it. Like there's these various different versions mm. of it, but they all have kind of like those similar like base traits. Uh, but yeah, so that's the main difference between Skinwalker and Wendigo. I see. Okay, that that's very helpful. I appreciate that. And then one one last piece of terminology. When you say flesh pedestrian, is that a separate thing or is that just an all-encompassing term for these two entities? So when I first started talking about this, a lot of people uh, jumped on me and they were like, you're not supposed to say the words. And I was like, oh, shoot, right, yes, you're not I've supposed to say the theory, words. Yeah. So I started saying flesh pedestrian instead because I was like, all right, this is a good way to not say the words and to kind of reference a general phenomenon. Um, okay. And then as I did more research, I found that... Uh, from a folklore standpoint, that whole, uh, you know, speak of the devil when he shall appear kind of thing um, is not universal. And also, I have said the word Wendigo a lot of times. <laughs> like, a lot of times. <laughs> yeah, I believe um, it. So from just, like, an empirical, like, data-driven approach to it, um, <laughs> either I'm, like I said in one of my videos, either uh, either saying it doesn't summon them or my apartment has really good security systems. Or you are the Wendigo. <laughs> I am not the Wendigo. <laughs> Joe Biden yeah, I'm is. Sure, I'm sure you get that product <laughs> a lot. Yeah. According to him, he's yeah. not. There's a, just, so, so nobody thinks that this is a political program. There was uh, an article in a, a satire website where um, it's uh, Joe Biden unprompted says, I am not, or Joe Biden is not the Wendigo. Um, and I just thought it was really funny because we encountered this article when we first started doing these videos. Yeah. Um, so I was like, oh, that's perfect. Um, that is beautiful. I, I do not think Joe Biden is a Wendigo. Um, Kamala that Harris be might be. For the ages. Uh, <laughs> I do find it entertaining that the headline of the article wasn't, he doesn't say he's not a Wendigo, he says he's not the Wendigo. And it's in the third person. Joe yeah. Biden unprompted, Joe Biden is not the Wendigo. Uh, it's just like... <laughs> Yeah, he said it without opening his mouth yeah, exactly. in like a very deep guttural <laughs> voice. Yeah. I am not I, the Wendigo. <laughs> I, I love I love the like absurdist humor of satire websites so much. Oh, yeah. like, it's... oh like the onion and click hole and all that. Yeah, yeah so it's, like, good. Also just so a heads up. It is eight twenty five. Yes, so we should definitely transition to super chats. Right? Yes. My yeah, lady, you okay with that? I am wonderful with all that. Right, let's make let's, it happen. Let's Perfect. do it. All right, people, floodgates are open. Ask away. Your your questions they can be for us, they can be for Milo. They could be for Aiden for some reason. Um. <laughs> I saw someone, I, I checked the chat briefly a while back, and I saw someone asking Aiden how he sold his script. Yeah, yeah no, I haven't, I haven't done it yet. Uh, I'm working in the process. Uh, I'm currently in the middle of a final revision before I speak with my contact about it again and hopefully find myself an agent or get you know connected with one. So we'll see how it goes. If it actually ends up going through, I'll let you all know. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yes. Uh, and thank you for that reminder, by the way, Milo. Um, so the first super chat we had is from Pyre Z for five dollars. Thank you very much. Where did that come from? Uh, it, was a while, it was a while back. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Ah, uh, they were getting ahead of the game. Oh, yeah. it's important. Yeah, it's, this is my whole job. This is the entire reason I'm here. So it I'm is very the entire excited reason to do it. Um, You're doing great. Thank you. Uh, so he <laughs> said, "I heard a few years ago that there were Viking remains found in Oklahoma. Do any of you? I'm assuming he means all of us." Uh, know about mm. that or the validity of it? Um, I hadn't heard about the Oklahoma one. I had heard about the, uh, I forget which state exactly, but there was, um, the, I think the Kensington Stone is the, the Kensington Runestone, um, which was uh, proven to be a hoax. I'm pretty sure it was because it was like the wrong form of Futhark. It was like, it should have been younger Futhark and it was an elder Futhark, or it might have been the other way around. Mm. Futhark being the the, the rune system used by the Vikings, the Viking alphabet, essentially, the Scandinavian alphabet. Um, mm. So I hadn't heard about the Oklahoma one. Um, I'll have to look into that. But yeah, likewise. I've never heard of that. I, I gotta say, I, if, if the Icelanders couldn't cut it in uh, Lanzo Meadows up in Newfoundland, 
I find it very unlikely that they managed to make it all the way to Oklahoma. Um, you know, the one of the primary things that made the the Scandinavians that made the the Norse the Vikings such good settlers and such good traders was that they had this fantastic system of colonies um, across Norway into Britain and Ireland and whatnot. So uh, when when they would get and, and this was a big problem with the uh, the invasion of England in um, in the eight sixties was they only had as many people as they came with. So if you lost men, you, you weren't uh, getting back, whereas the English could raise more men. You know, they, they could go to, you know, reserves and whatnot. The Vikings couldn't do that. So um, that's, that's kind of the issue I have with it. It would be really hard for a people that based so much of their strategy for raiding and trading and whatnot on the, the ocean, it would be very hard for them to make it to Oklahoma without us having other settlements along the way. Yeah, yeah. That, I I haven't heard of this um this particular find either. I'd be curious to look into it after. Um, but I just I I kind of agree, Aiden. I think it would be kind of difficult for that. I feel like we would have more evidence. I also yeah. think there would be some sort of residual oral evidence because if a if a group of people who are vastly different than the people who live on this continent made it all the way into the center of the continent, like to the point where they made like a burial out there, presumably, I think that there would have been more history of them, whether yeah. it be you know, through, 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 through told stories and whatnot. Cause there, there is, there, there is evidence of, you know, like the, the lasting effects of interaction in the, you know, um, Northeast from, you know, when, when they tried to settle, um, up there in the Lanceau Meadows and whatnot. Um, but you don't see anything, at least that I know of, um, you don't see anything like that in the Midwest. I, I think it's unlikely, but I'd be curious to look into it. Wonderful. Next up is from Jason Barlow for $5. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, it's kind of a double question. Uh, he asks, can you look into the Cede Ka of Lovelock Cave? And also, are Florida men natural predators of skinwalkers? That might explain why they're not reported here. <laughs> Believe it or not, that is not the first time that's been said to me. <laughs> <laughs> Good God. I, um, to be okay, fair, I, it seems like a valid reason. Yeah, so... Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry, so could could you... The C T K so S-I space. S-I space. T-E space C-A-H. C-T-K. Of, of Lovelock Cave. Am I the only one who's missing what uh, C T K is? I have absolutely no idea what yeah, you're talking about. I don't about. think anybody here knows. But I am writing it down. Um, he's so... saying, can you look into it? So he's not expecting us to know yeah, all so... the back. Well... I, I could tell you a little bit about Lovelock Cave. I don't know. I'm. I'm, I'm yeah, I mean, if you, if you, yeah, go ahead and Google what that means. Yeah. Um, but if you know Lovelock oh, Cave, go for it. Ka. Ka, yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, the Cite Ka are a legendary tribe whose mom. Okay, so they are the giants of Lovelock oh. Cave. That is the name of the giants. Okay, that is good to know. So, um, the Lovelock Cave, um, like, whole thing for for those who are uh, not up to date on it or up to speed on it is a. Uh, a, a little bit of a indigenous mythos that there is a group of uh, like a tribe of redheaded giants that lived in this cave um, in I think it was Lovelock, New Mexico, or what is oh, now Lovelock, I have New heard Mexico. This. Yeah, and they were like a cannibalistic tribe mm. that would you know come down and like kidnap people and eat them or something. Mm. Um, and so interestingly, um, they actually have found human remains in the cave, mm. um, but they were not giants. I think that they I think they did find people who were like six feet tall, so like they were tall, tall but they the weren't time. like you know yeah it's all for the time it's all for the area but they weren't like the giants that they were made up to be um, yeah, that's that's much like, a, the, 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 like goliath um in the bible like exactly you know, it suggested that he, he was you know if if this is a real story that he was probably only like six feet six feet two inches but yeah everyone else would have been like five five so um yeah. that that appears to, when everyone around you is five and a half feet tall lebron james is a giant um, yeah, oh, yeah, absolutely. he's fucking yeah. enormous. <laughs> he's really big. <laughs> yeah, so so I, I and again that that also kind of you know not to not to go back to where we were, but that touches on the idea that I think a lot of stories do come from some level of reality. Mm -hmm. um, you know, again, if if everyone around you is five feet tall, I'm I'm a firm believer that the story of David and Goliath is based off of something. Mm -hmm. You know, like what what that actual real life event was, I don't know. Um, but you know, it was it probably was like you just said, a guy a guy who's six five in you know 
the like yeah. three thousand years ago in the Middle East. Yeah, you're gonna be pretty tall. Interesting thing about Goliath. Um, so it's it's said that he's a giant. Um, it's the word Nephilim is not used for for Goliath. The word Nephilim is used in I think exactly three times in the Bible, twice in Genesis and one in uh, First Kings. I think first hmm. um, is never used to reference Goliath. So I, uh, you know, we, that that infers then that Nephilim does not mean giants and that it was mistranslated as giants. Ooh. Um, but also that That's Goliath that Goliath is not supposed to be of the same class. Um, so hmm. just a, a little interesting. Interesting thing there about, uh, you know, translation in the Bible. Uh, that's that's very interesting, actually, because I've gotten a lot of, you know, I've done my fair share of giant videos. Yeah. Um, and whenever I, I make those, them. I always get uh, comments about, you know, Goliath and Nephilim and biblical interpretations and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And so it, it's interesting to hear that distinction. Yeah. And the fact that Nephilim is only used three times. That's news to me. I, th from what I heard, it made it sound like it was used no. very frequently. It's used three times wow. in, the, in the canonical Bible and then uh, so many times in Enoch. Um, I've got, <laughs> hang on. Start counting. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, we're we're going to go right a little here. past 830. Yeah. Little um, Enoch. Right. This is, by the way, this is, this is very pretty. This is my, uh, Masonic Bible. It's just a KJV. Oh my goodness. For those of you who might be wondering, um, is Freemasonry a religion? I uh, no, this is a, this is a Christian Bible. Um, we're not all Christian either. Uh, we have Jewish and Muslim and Hindu Freemasons. But yeah, I just I, since I had it in my hand, I wanted to talk about it really quick. It's so pretty though, like it's. It is lovely. It's very shiny. Oh, yeah. It's it, it really is. Um, I just wanted it really quickly. Nothing. It's got some nice art see. in it. Like that's that's Jesus. Wow. Um. Yeah. <laughs> it's Jesus. Say, like, uh, who else I just want to find. There's one exact. Here, go go. Continue talking. I'm gonna look for the picture. Uh. Oh, well. Go ahead. I, I guess my 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 question. I, I have a quick question. Is how often. Do people um, accuse you of being in a cult as, as somebody who's involved with the Masons? Um, all the time. At least, at, every time I make a video about it, um, and other than that, probably once a week. Okay, valid. That makes sense. The, probably the best. The, be, the the reason I ask is the best co comment I've ever received a, a, that I can remember is someone wholeheartedly, to the best of my understanding, genuinely. Oh wow, is that is that George Washington? Yep. <laughs> you gotta love when your Bible has good old Our, our Lord and Savior. Yeah. That's amazing. There's an oh all-seeing eye over the U.S. Capitol in this image. It's fantastic. Oh my um, God! And I yeah, am, so, so I got, am I allowed one... to show you that. Um, okay, <laughs> we're good. I got I got one comment once that I'm I'm pretty sure was was wholeheartedly genuine. Um, where someone accused me of being um a I I, I think it was. A Freemason who is in charge of, or who is, is, was, I was paid by the Freemasons to spread the anti Christian lie of evolution. It's true. And that is what I'm I am the Freemason TikTok. that paid him. Um. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm making no, good money uh, off this. Which... Thanks for your donations. Oh my God. <laughs> I love it. I mean, if you want to be a Freemason, I can put you in contact with the right people, but they won't try and get you to spread the lie of evolution. Um, yeah, exactly. In fact, they would do the opposite. Yeah, if I wanted to get paid to spread. <laughs> if I wanted to get paid to spread evolution, I'd be a teacher, but it doesn't Yeah, exactly. Pay off, so. <laughs> Go be a science teacher. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so the next on the list is from Glass of Water for $5. Thank you very much. And Glass says, vague warning and soup. Oh, Also, course. editing this video for my channel is killing my hand and ears. My voice can peel paint. I, I'm not even going to... question? No. No, but that's, it, it, it was a vague, it was a vague warning and soup. Yep. Uh, valid. Okay. Yeah. Soup. Enough said. Thank you, glass of water. Appreciate you, your glass. contribution. Good soup. Um, glass. Thumbs up. Good soup. <laughs> Good soup. Uh, <laughs> next, next is from Islong for nineteen ninety nine. Thank you very much, Is. Ooh, uh, damn. Keeping Thank on brand. Three easy payments of nineteen ninety nine, and you can get this <laughs> wonderful dog. No, you no. can He's not for sale. You can get the soup. Soup. Yes, you can get some of Glass's soup for three easy payments of nineteen ninety nine. Please see. We what? are auctioning off their soup. Oh yes. Uh, she says, keeping on brand of never asking topical questions. What's everyone's favorite Thanksgiving food? There are valid answers, and my love and respect for you who will depend, and my love and respect for you will depend on what you say. Except Milo, guests can say whatever. I, I'm. 
I am a very uh, traditional man. Um, I like my turkey, my mashed potatoes, and my stuffing with a nice, healthy serving of gravy. I do not have anything against cranberry sauce, but um, I am not a, a huge proponent of the sauce. Mm -hmm. I'm even pickier than he is. I'm all in on the meat because I'm borderline carnivore. And I like the mashed potatoes. I like some of the other like nibble things here. I do not like stuffing. Something about the consistency. Really? Not a fan, yeah. But I do love pumpkin so, pie. So you don't like the Wawa pie. turkey bowl? I've never had it. You fool. Yes. Did you say Wawa? <laughs> yeah. Yes. Oh god. I have one of my roommates is from Jersey and he uh, ah, he is ah. he's He's trying to indoctrinate me. Oh, it's good yeah. stuff. Man. Um, it's great. It's good stuff. It's great. <laughs> as far as the Thanksgiving meal goes, I would I, I think my all time favorite would have to be the mashed potatoes. You just can't go wrong with that. Mm, um, turkey's always good, um, but probably the part that I, I really enjoy the most is the uh, apple pie. Apple pie is what oh, does it for me because yeah. I, I can't eat apples. I'm allergic. I have a stone fruit allergy, so I can't eat like apples and peaches, but I can eat them cooked. So really? eating an apple pie is the closest I can get to eating apples. Yeah. That... And the worst part is I developed it. I was not born allergic to apples. I love apples. I just can't eat them anymore. <laughs> the types of allergies that exist in this world fascinate me. It's because medical yeah. science has come so far that we don't die naturally anymore, so our body is trying to find ways to kill us. It's really just the, <laughs> it's the epitome of the human condition. It's like if life becomes too easy, easy, we will find things to become stressors. I will find a way to die and you will not stop me. Yeah. We'll never be able to Surprise, you're allergic to peaches. <laughs> yeah. You're going down. Sucks that you like fruit. Deal with this, why don't you? <laughs> oh my god. Jesus. That's incredible. Uh, no, the next one is from Iz again for one ninety nine, and she says, "I have my own dog. Archie is safe. <laughs> Thank God. Aww. I don't know what I would do without him in my life. He's a good boy. Man, he is very, very cute. He's oh, very fluffy yes. looking. Adorable. He's so soft. <laughs> next, Everything okay there? The next one is from Glass for five dollars, and she Let's said, see. "For nineteen ninety nine, I will teach you how to be submissive. Don't try and sell my day <laughs> morning and soup." <laughs> <laughs> Damn, lesson learned. But You'll be selling no more of your stupid. But when you teach us how to be breedable. <laughs> no, that that's a, that's part of the deluxe oh, package. You have to pay extra for that. Yeah, that's that's well she said in this one for nineteen ninety nine I'll teach you how to be submissive. So it's probably the three easy payments of that where we you get You also get to be oh. yeah. submissive, the second payment okay, is valid. and yes, and the third payment is yeah, the breedable. It's breedable. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Oh, we have an interesting audience, Man. Yeah, and we love it. We sure do. My God. Yeah, that's that's I'm looking that's... subversive and breathable, bro. Keep it up. Subversive and breathable. Subversive. Oh my God. <laughs> that's good. Uh, looking subtextual and bathable, my dude. Looking, uh, submersive. You can really and... run with that one. Submersive and uh... submersive and bathable. I like uh, that. Um, submersive and. Breakable? I can't think of anything. I'm subordinate bagel. and I was gonna say breakable. Beans. <laughs> Soup and beans. There it is. There we go. We are officially the most professional yes. podcast on the planet. We've done it. Yeah, right. let's go. Right. But yeah, that's that's are, it on super chats. Uh, are there are there further questions? We'll, we'll give, I'd else? say we'll give five minutes. Yep. Um, you know, are, are there any yeah, non-super chat questions? Uh, Inquisitor Loki said, I indoctrinated myself to the Church of Wawa on a road trip with my dad years ago, and then indoctrinated my roommate when we went up to PA a couple months ago. Thanks for visiting. It's, yeah, thank you for visiting. Um, um, it is yeah. a it, it is a mecca. It is a, a mecca of good food. Yep. Um, Isn't it just like a gas station? Yep. Yep. Pretty much. It's like a <laughs> so here's what you need to understand and, about Wawa. Well, that's the... um, it is, it has, it, they just come out, so they started as like a gas station that also served, served fresh made hoagies. Mm. Um, good hoagies. Good they hoagies. Yeah, keep very good, good hoagies. hoagies. Um, but they, uh, over time, started adding other things, and it's just become this uncanny, like, phenomenon where Wawa will be like, hey, we have this now, and you're like, that's not going to be good, and then you try it, and it's the best thing you've ever had for $5. Um, we got some Mind more. blowing. So, like, turkey bowls. They have, oh. It's just mashed potatoes, stuffing, oh, cranberry I, yeah, sauce. Yeah, I already turkey. mentioned that, yeah. It's fantastic. Um, 
They've got uh, biscuits and gravy sometimes. I love it. Why is it good? I don't know. They have quesadillas. Shouldn't be good. Are. Yeah. They, they just introduced paninis, and they're phenomenal. No, no, um, they're Damn, there paninis. you go. Yeah, and their coffee. The coffee their stuff. coffee is so good. Yep. It is like gas the, station coffee. It's good gas station coffee. And they have Irish it's, cream creamer. Okay, it's wait. Like, well, here's the thing. This is a good way to look at it. It's like if 7-Eleven, Dunkin' Donuts, and like a corner store deli yeah. got all wrapped into one. It's like they all had some wow. funky polyamorous yeah. baby. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The love child of yes, all these basically, things. Basically, yeah. And it's a chain. So, all right, we got two more uh, super okay. chats. Uh, Those are the last ones. Uh, one, one of them from Glass of Water for five dollars, saying, <laughs> "For the low, low payment of redacted, <laughs> I can help you join the void and redacted, while also <laughs> redacted. Join now." <laughs> and then I get mean, okay, like SCP text. Oh yeah. Personally, I would love to be redacted. Um, so I mean, who wouldn't love to be redacted? The Industrial Revolution and its consequences have been redacted. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I love how that works as an actual <laughs> sentence too. I, I, I want to put that on a shirt. We should. <laughs> Uh, and then the last one is from Classy for one ninety nine, and he simply says, "I'm assuming he, she, uh, whoever you are, they, uh, they, uh, the simply singular say, they. They, they simply <laughs> say Xbox, PlayStation, or PC." Uh so I play like personally, I prefer to play on a controller, unless I'm playing strategy game. Mm. Um, so even when I'm on PC, I use my Xbox controller. Uh, Assassin's Creed games, I've only ever played on Xbox. Um, I assume with a controller it could be fine on PC as well, but Assassin's Creed is a horrible game to play with a mouse and keyboard. Um, <laughs> it's terrible. Uh, but uh, yeah, so for like for first person shooters and adventure games, um, I've definitely always leaned towards Xbox, mainly for the controller format. Mm-hmm. Um, but I have a really nice gaming PC now that I bought instead of getting the Series X. I basically any game I play on it, I can use a controller. So I'm kind of in a weird spot where like xbox but if i can run it better on the pc i'd put it on the pc yeah i'm pretty much exclusively pc at this point purely i I literally i got a pc in order to play games with my friends when they were going away to college and now that's just kind of the thing because we all have pcs so we do that yeah, I was looking at the, the ROG laptop you got going on yeah. there, and I was like, I'm, I'm going to guess PC. I was kind of surprised when you said Xbox. Yeah, yeah this, I, I'm, I'm this also one's a ROG. PC person. I'm, that one's also, that's yeah. the same computer, just six years newer. <laughs> um, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I feel that. No, P- PC is definitely my, my go-to yeah. as well. And it, it's been quite, I think the first like time I've really gotten used to using controllers was going to college, and my friends had a, a Switch. So I have to like <laughs> learn how to use the pro controller and what, whatnot. What but games for Mario Kart, it's not hard. Oh, uh, Smash Ultimate. No, <laughs> no, no, no. I mean, on what on PC? Oh, what are you, you playing? Oh, oh, on PC. Oh, as of right now, I've been playing through um, Far Cry Six. Uh, right. Has been pretty good. I, I recently got Teardown because I saw someone playing it somewhere, and that's. I want to get that so like badly. Is it worth it? It's fun. It's really fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's really good. I highly recommend it. Um, but as far as like, I guess uh, in this genre, um, I, I guess probably like one of my favorite games of all time is Civ Five. You can't go wrong. Right. Oh man! So. Oh, we could have a fun Civ Five oh. game. We could have a oh, fun. Five. We could Twitch stream a really oh. fun oh. Civ Five I'd be, I'd be game. Oh. Yeah, I mean, me, you, him, Steven, yeah. uh, Wendy Goon would probably help in on that. And it could be interesting because I've never played Civ Five, so you guys could teach yeah. me a little bit. I've played a lot of Civ Five. I'm terrible at it. Um, perfect. I, I'm one of those people like who's like in hundred hours in that. I'm one of those people who are like I want my people to be happy, and then I pay no That's attention bad. whatsoever to scientific progress. But <laughs> damn, are my people happy? Um, and then we Ignorance get okay. split. That that is that has to be the the bookend for this podcast. The cliffhanger is going to be we have to put together an archaeology yep. talk. Uh, Sim game. game that yeah, will I'm totally down. I, I am totally so down. here for it. I'm so we here for it. We get two more super chats. I don't know if you want to. Go we got ahead. more super chats. Yeah, just from Is in glass. Yeah, I mean, if you sure. Throw them real quick. Uh, real quick, Is said uh, Thornberry is on thin ice with his answer. Mattis is safe. <laughs> My good sir, stuffing is the best part. It is the best part. So apparently, best. I am wrong. Uh, no surprises. Uh, oh, we got three. Um, glass of water for five dollars says redacted is for the lower class. The upper class are getting redacted. <laughs> But the truly miserable can be promoted if in the cult of redacted. 
<laughs> and then Classy for one ninety nine says, "Do it, do the stream." And it looks right. like we will. Uh, we will we're, leading, to do it. we're leaning towards doing yeah. so. Uh, did we have a milk you got chain it, Classy? Uh, right when we were starting, there was a milk chain. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, right the milk chain got done. Yeah, we um, we can't have a stream without a milk chain. The milk chain has to be done. Also, <laughs> if you haven't if you haven't seen it, I'm not saying you have to buy it, but we do have the Wendigo Milkman shirts on the. Go check it out at the very at the lore, if, if you <laughs> go to the lorelodge.shop, you're going to see some great things and some great original artwork from uh, our good friend Norman Keyes. Yes. Um, there is there is a, a Wendigo with a Milkman outfit. Um, there's there's a Wendigo that doesn't have a Milkman outfit. And then, of course, there's uh, our, our logo, which is this guy. Yes. Mm-hmm. And these shirts are all extraordinary. Pretty solid shirt. They're so comfortable. Yeah. Too. Surprisingly nice. comfortable. Yeah. But all right, so I think that that about does it. Uh, Milo, do you want to really quickly want to uh, you know plug plug your stuff? Uh, any yeah, any I'll, I'll do my merch, whatever. Go for it. My little bit at the end here. Um, well, anyway, I, I guess thank you guys very much for having me on. This has oh, been a bunch of fun. Uh, for those of you that don't follow me, my uh, my TikTok is Mini Minute Man, um, and I also uh, am on Instagram as Mini Minute Man. Um, so if you'd like to check that out, or my YouTube, they're all the exact same username, uh, but I have longer videos posted on YouTube, and eventually uh, Aiden and I will be collaborating on YouTube to make the, uh, um, the Ancient Rome debunking video. It should be fun. Um, but yeah, check me out on Instagram, TikTok, YouTube. Um, I look forward to seeing all of you guys there, and uh, Aiden's, thank you so much for having me here this evening. This has been a ton of fun, and I, uh, I look, I look forward to playing Civ with y'all. I think oh yeah, I'm excited now. Happen. I'm excited. Yeah, All right, <laughs> Milo, thank you so much. Uh, I, I think probably everyone here is probably already following you and everything. But if you're not, make sure you go follow him. Uh, does Do some it. great stuff, even if sometimes um, I feel a little bit hurt by what he says. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but he says it. He I says it with Aiden. such shot de vive. Uh, uh, but, oh, we're really ending it class. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, thank you, everybody, for yeah, stopping really. by. I'm Aiden Mattis, and I. I, I ah, fuck, I messed it up. I'm Aiden Mattis, and thanks for stopping by the Lore Lodge. <laughs> <laughs>